Okay, well, this is uh, so interesting, of course, and so broad that uh, it's hard to be systematic, so I'm going to try to make just two or three points, which might not be that connected to um, um, each other. But it's interesting that the uh, human evolution, uh, people who study human evolution are coming to a view uh, that what makes us so special as a primate species is our um, ability to function as teams, and that in most other primate species and most other uh, social species, uh, there's so much competition within groups uh, that the group finds it difficult to function as a team. And every once in a while in evolution, that shifts, and you get groups that literally turn into organisms uh, because they, their members exhibit such teamwork. And so social insects are like that. Our own bodies are like that. There's wonderful stories that I could tell you about how we are, in fact, the groups, the social groups of past ages. So uh, what does it mean for a primate uh, such as our, ourselves to be adapted for uh, teamwork? Uh, especially in the case of small-scale groups. And, and this might seem uh, academic, but I think it's actually deeply relevant. Uh, Tocqueville has this wonderful comment that, uh, that the human township is the only unit that is so natural that it constitutes itself. So if you put 30 people together, they just work as a team instinctively, basically. When the groups become larger, then you need to add something, and that something is what we call culture, okay? Uh, actually, there's culture even in small groups, but... Uh, so what is it that causes humans to um, function as a team, even, uh, especially in small groups? It has all to do with a kind of guarded egalitarianism, because the world does not lack individuals that want to dominate others, and we recognize that easily as unethical behavior. Power, unfair use of power, uh, that clearly is at the center of unethical behavior. Um, but with small groups uh, of humans, What's so great about them is, is that no individual can become a bully because the other members of the group can easily put them down, okay? It begins with gossip and it escalates from there. So we have a very interesting sense of egalitarianism, which uh, is a guarded form of egalitarianism. And so, um, and it's referred to as a, uh, as a moral community. So the concept of moral, morality and norms uh, and ethics comes in at the very beginning as part of the heart of what it means to, uh, uh, to, be, um, uh, to be human. Now to fast forward to the uh, present, when I look, for example, uh, 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 evolution is in part such a turbulent subject because of its abuses in the past. Uh, people are threatened by evolution in part because of uh, social Darwinism, for example, used as an explanation for social inequality of all, um, of all sorts. Uh, I invite you to read not only that uh, history, but also the history of the, um, of the exact opposite of behaviorism, for example, in the um, uh, social sciences, and you'll also find abuses. So um, uh, these kinds of abuses are not limited to any particular theory. They're limited to the use of all theories, all knowledge, uh, just like other forms of abuses. And what makes them unethical and so threatening is the uh, imbalance of power, basically, uh, that these were uh, uh, policies, basically, that were being presented without consensus. And I, uh, um, ethics is very complex, but it seems to me it's one simple thing that you can say about ethics is that when people get together and they make a consensus decision, so everyone agrees that this is what they want, that becomes ethically benign. And when they don't do that, when some individuals impose their decisions on others and there's not a power structure which, which, which favors egalitarianism, then that becomes ethically sinister. And so uh, this has much to do then with, uh, uh, with social systems that erect an appropriate balance of power and um, so that we can make consensus decisions and then we can do things that we want. When, when, when modern social systems um, embrace that, then, uh, then they become ethical. And when they don't embrace it, then they become um, unethical. So those are some, uh, those are some uh, simple preliminary comments. I also want to wait, say something about individuals versus cultures. Uh, there's a wonderful social psychologist named uh, Jonathan Haidt, who actually was here a few weeks ago giving a lecture. He has a paper in Science called uh, The New Synthesis in Moral Psychology. And one of the things that he shows, not just asserts, but shows with his wonderful research, is that there is more than one 
uh, moral system and that, uh, and that uh, college folks uh, are at a handicap because they're almost invariably uh, liberally inclined and liberalism is their moral system. But when you study morality and uh, what we mean by morality more broadly, then you encounter, uh, especially outside of universities, moral systems which we would regard as, as conservative. And those moral systems play a high place a high value on authority and obedience to authority, which fundamentally, at some level, comes down to a lack of questioning. And so although I enjoyed Stephen's comments, um, very much and agree with them actually because I'm a liberal <laughs> and so I like the idea of questioning everything. Um, I think I would be speaking on behalf of, uh, of, uh, of my colleague John uh, Haidt uh, that that's not a description of all moral systems and that we need to broaden as intellectuals we need to broaden our understanding of what moral systems are and recognize authority and obedience to authority as a virtue under some circumstances, and even a virtue that us liberals must uh, embrace because, because uh, life is too complex for us to think everything through, to question everything. Literally questioning everything would, be, would, would induce a form of paralysis in all of us. So all of us need a structure, a cultural structure that we don't have to question, that does some of the decision making for us. And then we can question some things within the context of a cultural system. I mean, because questioning is hard work. And if you had to question everything, then it just, it's just a non-starter. So nobody questions everything. And so we all need cultures. And oddly enough, it seems that uh, uh, this, this view causes you to appreciate culture more than ever because you realize that, it's the, that there's a lot of wisdom in culture that we don't understand uh, at all. all. A lot of wisdom that, that's accumulated over the uh, over the ages, and it works, but we don't know why it works. And that was another point that Tocqueville made. We have these customs, and we don't know why it works. It's like the Wizard of Oz in the hot air balloon at the end of the movie when he's taking off, and Dorothy says, come back, come back. And he says, I can't, I don't know how it works. And so I think in many ways, we're all in hot air balloons of cultures that we're in, and we don't know how they work. And of course, we have to study how they work. That's a, that's a very chief um, goal as an intellectual is to, is to study how uh, cultures work. The last point I want to make in my 10 minutes, of many points that, uh, um, that could be made, is at a very practical level, and often efforts to implement ethical practice uh, run terribly af uh, afoul and, and wrong. And if we, when we think in practical terms about implementation, then it's a little bit, and I am, I'm a liberal, I want to say, I might be speaking like a conservative, but you know, people say all the time, you know, the bureaucracy that begins to surround things can just have the opposite effect of what is intended. And as Exhibit A, I offer the uh, animal uh, care procedures. So any researcher, that works on humans, of course, is an elaborate regulatory system, as there should be. And anyone who works on animals, there's an elaborate procedure you have to go through to do any research on animals, as there should be. Because there's no doubt that there's unethical treatment of animals that should not take place. So yes, we need oversight, et cetera, et cetera. But the way that the bureaucracy has developed has gone in such absurd directions that, for example, if you teach an animal behavior class, which should be introducing students to the wonders of the natural world and, animal, and, and, and how animals behave, you cannot act not any vertebrate. You can only work on things like crickets. Well, crickets are wonderful creatures. And by the way, why are we, why are we drawing an ethical divide between verte vertebrates and invertebrates anyhow? That's absurd. So this is the kind, and it goes on from there. My wife, who's an animal behaviorist, has some uh, budgies that she works on. Those are your pet stork parakeets. Uh, she's worked on them from se for many years. They're aged now. Uh, this is behavioral research. She wants to give them away to an old age home. Well, she can't. She has to sacrifice them. She has to kill them because of these Byzantine rules. So the point, I'm not trying to, I mean, I don't want to dwell on specifics, but it seems to me that ethical practice ultimately does come down to, you know, what you actually implement 
and we can get to these surreal situations <laughs> when, when, we, um, when we're uh, overenthusiastic about, about doing this. So, here's my 10 minutes.